Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, this is a wonderful place. This is a fabulous conference. I do this for a living, and I've learned a whole lot today. So uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm going to speak about the uh, social and economic consequences of the uh, China's uh, rise of the US-China trade shock. And uh, this figure, I'm sure, is familiar to you, shows China's share of manufacturing exports, award, world exports, going from essentially zero to uh, over 20% at present. And what's remarkable about that, about that figure is not that it's 20%, because uh, China is an enormous country with tons of resources, an educated population. Uh, there's every reason they should be an enormous uh, contributor to world trade. What's, a, what's amazing is their rise from almost nothing to the top of that chart in the course of uh, you know, two and a half decades. That is a three and a half decades. Uh, that's a world historical achievement, and it's incredibly consequential. I'll say more about that. Um, but uh, let's just think about how we got here. Uh, really, there's, there's really at least two major acts to this play. One is internal reforms within China, brought about by Deng Xiaoping, who uh, had a long history uh, both in, uh, in war and in, uh, in peacetime, was exiled under Mao, having first served Mao, and then became the Communist Party chairman, and brought about the period of reform and opening that allowed China to accept foreign direct investment, to use the price system, to set up special export zones uh, along the coast, and to allow the free movement of hundreds of millions of people from relatively unproductive rural agriculture into highly productive manufacturing. This led to a period of unprecedented productivity growth, uh, economic growth, uh, benefits that brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China and created prosperity throughout sub-Saharan Africa, through La uh, Central and South America, resource booms. Most of the investment going on at present in sub-Saharan Africa is coming from China. So in terms of kind of world historical economic miracles, we should never lose sight of uh, how valuable, how uh, incomparable China's rise has been. This is the best thing that's happened to the world's middle class since forever, actually. And in fact, there really wasn't a world middle class prior to China. So it is remarkable. Um, and just many have shown such figures of comparing Shenzhen or Shanghai before and after. I will do the same with one difference. So this is uh, 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 Shenzhen seen in 1979 from Hong Kong. This is Shenzhen seen in 2019 from Hong Kong. And this is Gordon Hansen, my co-author, looking. Uh, no one else had Gordon Hansen as a child in their slide. So I think I, I, think I got this round. Uh, so you can think of this uh, as occurring essentially in three phases. One is the initiation of China's reforms. It's reform and opening where its share of US manufacturing rises from under 1% to about 3%. Then in 2001, uh, China joins the WTO. And this is a function both of China's reforms and policy led by Washington to bring China into the world trading system and led to a series of additional reforms that China had to make in its own time to make its economy comply and actually made it a much more competitive country. And then since around 2010, there's a, been a period of stabilization. There's been actually a lot of political retrenchment. Productivity growth is much slower. Uh, and there's a lot of backsliding. So you can really think of this period in particular from about 2000, 2010 as corresponding to what many people now think of as the China trade shock. Um, so that's how we got here. That's how China got there. How did we get here? Well, the case for free trade uh, is well known. It's uh, David Ricardo's big idea, the British Portuguese economist, uh, who coined the phrase uh, comparative advantage. And he said, look, trade allows countries to specialize in the goods and services in which they are most productive. Free trade among consenting nations raises GDP in all of them. And that's correct. And uh, this is well uh, stated by Paul Krugman, who I will quote several times in this talk because uh, uh, he's so articulate. <laughs> uh, and he wrote in 1997, if economists rule the world, there would be no need for a World Trade Organization. The economist case for free trade is essentially a unilateral case. A country serves its own interest by pursuing free trade, regardless of what other countries may do. But here's the rub. Uh, there are winners and losers. Uh, what's true for the welfare of a country of a as a whole is not necessarily true for all the citizens of that country. Trade normally, in fact, 
almost necessarily makes some people better off and some people worse off. So it grows the pie, but it shrinks some slices in absolute terms. And unless you have a redistributive system in place, you're going to have people who are worse off. And in general, the benefits are going to be diffuse and the costs are going to be concentrated. And uh, economists have known this for a long time, though they haven't always said it as loudly as the first half. Uh, they, they say the Ricardian half and not so much uh, the John Barrymore role as Hamlet saying there's the rub. Um, and Krugman also says this elsewhere in his textbook uh, with Maury Oberfeld, owners of a country's abundant factors gain from trade, but owners of a country's scarce factors lose. That means that international trade tends to make low-skilled workers in the United States worse off, not just temporarily, but on a sustained basis. And the theory does, that is, the theory is pretty clear on that, again, without redistribution. So how did this play out in the United States? Well, this shows you the share of manufacturing U.S. employment from several different directions as a share of non-farm employment, as a share of labor force, as a share of population. And it's been declining for a while, of course. Um, but you can see this inflection point in 2000 or 2001 when China w joins the WTO. Things fall off a cliff further during the Great Recession, but that's not because of trade. Here's a more dramatic way to see it. This gives you the number of people employed in US manufacturing from 1938 to 2020. And uh, it's almost hard to believe, but the high watermark of US manufacturing employment was in 1979 when there were 19.4 million manufacturing workers, that slowly ebbed to 17.4 over the next two decades, and then fell by nearly 4 million workers between 1999 and 2007. And that was a trade phenomenon. It had to do with China getting permanent most favored nation trading status, joining the WTO, currency manipulation, many other factors. But that was very directly and closely related to trade. It's dramatic. Uh, and of course, when you think about the impacts of trade, you might say, well, 4 million jobs in a country of 150 million workers, like that's a drop in the bucket. And that would be true if those jobs were evenly distributed across counties in the United States. But manufacturing is not like hospitals or restaurants or drugstores. Uh, it's done in a few places in much higher intensity and not just manufacturing in general, but specific industries are in specific places. So the China trade shock, when it comes, it's going to affect the viability of firms and sectors and locations all at once. So this figure shows you the intensity of exposure. Uh, darker red uh, is higher intensity. And the most exposed industries were furniture and fixtures, games and toys, sporting and athletic goods, plastic products, motor vehicle parts. This was labor intensive, low tech manufacturing. A lot of it concentrated in the Southern United States where it had migrated down from the North as was er uh, mentioned earlier. So this is the least educated and lowest paid part of manufacturing, but these were good jobs for the people who held them relative to their outside options. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, here's uh, data on West Hickory, North Carolina, formerly the form furniture capital of the world, self-titled. The percent of working age adults in manufacturing fell from 34% to 15% between 1990 and 2016. Uh, the percent of adults that were employed at all fell from 55% to 43%, and transfers per capita rose from 3,400 to 9,600 uh, in a very short period of time. Or here is Martinsville, Virginia, uh, formerly the, sweat, the sweatshirt capital of the world, and that's not the only thing they made. Uh, but manufacturing employment fell from 45% to 13% of labor force uh, over the course of 25 years, and the fraction of adults who were working fell from about three quarters to about half transfers also rose. There are many, many examples like that. Uh, I won't harp on them, uh, but uh, these, were, you know, this was not a mystery to the people in Martinsville, Virginia, uh, excuse me, yeah, in Virginia, what was actually happening to them. Now, there's lots of data now. We know that the places that uh, were most exposed saw big drops in manufacturing employment. Nothing was happening the decade before. In the 1970s, manufacturing was growing. And that's because, as we said, uh, manufacturers moving south out of right to work, uh, out of, excuse me, out of heavily unionized states, out of more expensive states, and down to the south where labor was cheaper and there were right to work laws that made it very difficult for workers to unionize. So this is not entirely surprising. In some sense, this is what's supposed to happen. In fact, let me show you, it works just like the theory says. Now, I'm going to give you data from the UK because I don't have comparable data from the US, but the story would be the same. Here is the change in 
Chinese import exposure in the United Kingdom between 1999 and 2007 by industry, and on the vertical axis is the price change. And you can see things where there was a big growth in exposure, there were big declines in prices, just like they're supposed to be. Shoes, garments, jewelry, appliances, right? Not much of a decline in the price of fish, right? Not coming from China. Here is employment in those same industries. Garments, shoes, appliances, jewelry, and furniture, right? Prices came down, employment fell. These are two sides of the same coin. That's what's supposed to happen. We were not, you know, China had lower prices, higher productivity in these sectors. We started importing Chinese, or the UK started importing Chinese goods, and workers moved out of those sectors. Now, that's how it's supposed to work. So the question is, where did they move to? How did that turn out? Well, unfortunately, the evidence is it didn't turn out well. In general, in places that lost manufacturing, there was not a corresponding rebound in non-manufacturing, which is what you'd like to see. Instead, most of the loss was absorbed by rising unemployment and by declines in labor force participation. And uh, not surprising still, uh, that was even more concentrated among less educated workers. So that's the surprise, right? It's not that trade affected manufacturing employment. That's sort of how it's supposed to work. Now, if we had to export a lot more manufacturers, we could have just reallocated across sectors. That didn't happen. That is related to the trade deficit. So people had to move in service into, into services. They didn't do that that successfully. And so we saw a lot of labor market scarring. And it is unfortunately the case that many of these places have not subsequently rebound, rebounded. Excuse me. So even though the China shock plateaued after 2010, we do not see a revitalization in most of the places where adversely affected, those scars are enduring. And I think many people are surprised by that, many people are puzzled by that, and we don't see much population movement out of those places. This doesn't fit with what most economists thought the US labor market operated like, but the data are pretty clear on this, unfortunately. Now, let me, instead of quoting from Paul Krugman, let me call quote from William Julius Wilson, who wrote in 1996, a neighborhood in which people are poor but employed is different from a neighborhood in which people are poor and jobless. Many of today's problems in the inner city, although we could have been talking in the South, uh, ghettos, crime, family dissolution, welfare, low levels of social organization, and so on, are fundamentally a consequence of the disappearance of work. So for example, if you read J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy before he went insane, uh, he said very similar things. <laughs> um, and you can see this also in the data. Uh, places that were much more exposed. We saw a fall off in earnings, but we especially saw a fall in earnings at the bottom for men. Uh, and uh, manufacturing is relatively male labor intensive. It's relatively high paid for low educated males. And so not only was there a general decline in income, but there was a, a, a change in kind of, uh, I don't know if I want to say a reversal of gender ranking, but, but a closing of the gender gap in earnings because men's earnings fell relatively more. That corresponded simultaneously with a decline in marriage rates among uh, uh, women 18 to 39, a change in household structure in the fraction of people living with spouses, living with partners, moving to other arrangements, a rise in the fraction of children uh, living in poor households, uh, living with grandparents, living with single parents. That's a pretty sizable rise, actually. Uh, and even an increase in what uh, the economist Angus Case, sorry, Ann Case and Angus Deaton uh, have called deaths of despair. Some have disputed that term, uh, but there's a variety of evidence that we do see a growth in premature mortality associated with drug and alcohol poisoning uh, and other self-inflicted harms, actually a rise in suicide among women. So what is to say, this is not to say trade is killing people, uh, but simply that this is symptomatic of social despair, of maladies, of people losing identity, losing purpose, uh, losing opportunity, and, uh, and lots of bad things happen when that occurs. So this is not about trade specifically. It's about the consequences of sudden economic shocks without appropriate policies in place uh, to adapt to them. So it's interesting as well, why were appropriate policies not in place? Well, I think one reason, this, I hinted at this in my question earlier, and this is my opinion, and others may not share it, uh, is that 
the economic profession had sort of you know, told half the story to politicians, which is trade raises GDP among consenting nations. And that's true. Uh, but they didn't tend to emphasize, but it's also redistributive. It will tend to create losers as well as winners. Those losers could be very concentrated. Why didn't economists say that more loudly? I think there's two reasons. One is we kind of, I think, you know, if I, I remember as a graduate student being very inspired by this notion, trade is good, it raised GDP, we should always want to do it. I read Paul Krugman's words, you know, unilaterally we should want to trade with everyone. And, and the other, so we kind of tended to weight up <laughs> uh, the, the positive side and not focus on the downside. The other is the evidence wasn't very clear on the downsides, right? There had been a lot of research on this and no one had really seen it. And maybe, and I think there's now a reevaluation actually of the old evidence to realize there was more going on than we saw. But we weren't looking at it in the right way. So the combination of those things, uh, you know, encouraged economists to encourage politicians to the view that embracing trade was a win win. It would raise GDP, it would make us more dynamic, it would help build the bridge to the future, the 21st century, as Bill Clinton said. And it wouldn't have much downside cost. And of course, it's also important to recognize that ushering China into the WTO, which was the key role that the US played, was considered a way of bringing China into the democratic fold. And it didn't work out as expected. But it, let's say the US hadn't worked to admit China to the WTO. China had not been admitted to the WTO. And we were now exactly, we were, we, and we were exactly where we are now. That, that one fact had changed, but the rest of history had played out, we would say it's because we didn't allow China into WTO, <laughs> right? So in fact, it, you know, if you run the thought experiment, uh, there, there's, it's clear that was the right choice ex ante, even if it didn't work out correctly. Okay, so um, Paul Krugman, again, I, one thing I, I vastly admire about him is he's someone who corrects his thinking and understanding in real time and announces it in the New York Times. Uh, I would announce it too if someone asked me. Uh, he said, uh, economists, myself included, have tended to underplay the disruptive effects of rapid change. Many of us feel that we miss something important about the downsides of rapid globalization. So one thing that I think uh, uh, people were not attentive to was potential political consequences as well. So we're all aware of the degree to which American politics have polarized. So this is a very useful tracking survey run by the Pew Center. They ask people 10 attitudinal questions having to do with your views on global warming, on taxes, on the deservingness of the poor, on interracial marriage. Turns out your, your views on interracial marriage are extremely correlated with your views on taxes and global warming. I don't know why it's true, uh, but they become more so over time. So in 1994, 64% of Republicans were to the right of the median Democrat. Now that's not very far. If they were evenly distributed, 50% would be to the right and 50% would be to the left. Uh, and 70% uh, of Democrats were to the left of the median Republican. By 2017, this is still now five years old, 97% of Democrats were to the left of the median Republican and 95% of the Republicans were to the right of the median Democrat. So a question is, has trade policy or at least trade shocks played into that? So I think there, we have some evidence on that. Um, if you look at US House elections, uh, places that became more exposed to the China trade shock, shock saw a very large increase in the probability that a Republican would win a House seat. Um, and not just any Republican, uh, this is the, I know this thing looks like kind of you know, dancing, dancing lines, but the message that comes out of this figure is that the people who lost in trade exposed areas were moderates of both parties. The people who gained were ideologues of the right. And so the trade shock played a role in the kind of decimation of moderates uh, in the House of Representatives in the period uh, between 2000 and 2016. It also may have played some role in the presidential election of 2016. So let me, let me first show you the, the data, then I, I want to qualify what I'm saying. <laughs> So this uh, lines up the, uh, the, uh, the crucial swing states uh, in the 2016 election. And uh, you'll recall that uh, Donald Trump won by 306 votes, uh, Hillary Clinton by 232, but this was a very, by 200, 306 electoral votes, this is a very close election, a very close election. So if you dial back the China trade shock by 10%, according to our estimates, this is a notional experiment, 
uh, Michigan moves into the Clinton column. If you dial it back by 25%, uh, Wisconsin moves into the Clinton column. If you dial it back by 50%, Pennsylvania swings the other way as well. It could have turned out differently. Now, I want to qualify that in two ways. First of all, this is a conceptual experiment that you can't really run, right? This is, this is the result of a, a statistical analysis. It doesn't correspond to rearranging the world. Uh, second of all, it was a very close election. So many, many things could have done that. So uh, I do not want to suggest that the trade shock is the reason Donald Trump was president. There are many, many reasons Donald Trump was president. Um, but uh, among many factors that was going on, this was shifting the country in that direction and creating a lot of anger and polarization. Uh, and I think that's a contributor to where we are now. So let me summarize with five points. Uh, the first is, it's not trade per se. Many of those China-exposed jobs and industries would have left our shores over the next couple of decades. There's just no reason the US should be making textile, making you know, underwear, commodity furniture, assembling dolls, you know, making cheap building materials. We're an expensive country. It's not, the, it's not an economically efficient thing to do here. So these were legacy industries. What the China trade shock did was accelerate that process enormously. But that acceleration is consequential. The rate of change matters because there's a natural ebb and flow of industries. When an industry starts to decline, people leave it and young people don't enter it. And so it can sunset slowly. Like trucking has multiple millions of uh, full-time trucking workers. 20 years from now, there'll be many, many fewer. But if that's a gradual process, as it almost surely will be, because that's heavy infrastructure you don't replace overnight, that will be accompanied by retirements and slowing entries. It will not be that traumatic. In fact, trucking now has a shortage of workers because people have got the memo ahead of time that there's no trucking jobs left. There actually still are. So what this did was accelerate the rate of change, but that acceleration matters. It matters a lot that it happened so fast. Uh, the second, on the political side, the China shock was a catalyst of US polarization. It was not the only cause. We can look at many other countries that are undergoing similar politics, including our friend Sweden, right, which is always held up as an example of trade adjustment and so on. Uh, and, they, uh, and they are also moving to the right. Uh, there's, you, know, you can look in France. You can look in Germany. So there are many things that seem to be giving rise to polarization. The China trade shock was one of the contributors, but it was, it was not the only one. It wasn't necessary. And we've had similar reactions elsewhere. So I don't want to overplay that, uh, that uh, claim. Uh, the third, and I, I mentioned earlier this kind of reanalysis, more than most people realize, NAFTA was actually a prelude to or a prequel to the China trade shock. Recent evidence by Ji Wan Chao and others at Princeton and elsewhere show that one, NAFTA actually had more of an employment effect than we realized and reduced employment in the most NAFTA exposed counties in the, uh, in the, in the south, uh, in southwest. And interestingly, and I think this is actually even more consequential for politics, um, by the time Clinton, uh, Clinton administration brought through NAFTA, the kind of traditional Democrats were hanging on to the Democratic Party, blue collar workers, by a thread. And that thread was support for labor and support for unions. In many ways, they had already split culturally, right? Culturally on race, on abortion, and so on. And the thing that kept blue collar workers in the Democratic tent was support for labor. And NAFTA cut that thread by which they were dangling. And so in some ways, that was a more fundamental and foundational change to US politics, although it took a while to realize. And only now are we discovering actually how important that was. So there was a prelude there, uh, but we kind of missed it. Um, a fourth point is that the China shock as we knew it is over, right? China is in a different era economically. This is not going to happen again. Uh, from China, I don't think we're going to have an India shock of anything like that. So this was a one-time event with huge global benefits and some concentrated costs in the United States, which we badly mismanaged. Um, so the China's in, China's in a different era economically, and the US and China are in a completely different era strategically. Right? We long for the days when we could just worry about textile jobs and commodity furniture. Right? That's not what the US-China concern is about anymore. Uh, we'd like to go back to that time. And so finally, looking forward, I think the question we should be asking ourselves is whether 
economic protections, but also social investments can limit future damage, whether from trade, from technology, from pandemic. Uh, we know that if you look across countries, people lose jobs in all countries. Uh, but what are the consequences of job loss vary hugely, right? So in uh, Denmark, leader of flex security, job loss uh, leads to about a 10% reduction in earnings five years later. Uh, in uh, Italy or Spain, it's on the order of 30%. The US is on the order of 20%. It's not because the jobs are more valuable, it's because the institutions that help reactivate workers are so non-existent or atrophied here relative to the investments countries make elsewhere. So addressing these issues, it's not so much about trade policy, it's about inward-facing social policy, recognizing jobs are important, not just for earnings, but for identity, and that we can affect the way we respond to these changes and uh, get some of those benefits, grow that pie without letting so many slices uh, shrink away. Okay, thank you very much.